Doug Hillary. Oh, you were People from Turtle Mountain. We Ewing the Canuck and it's not very young, that's so you can say that. So I've been here uh, for a long time, uh, coming up here for the last 15 years. And uh, I'm from Leech Lake, Minnesota, uh, 390 miles from here. And uh, it takes about four and a half hours to get here, depending on how fast I drive. This is my daughter back there, Athena. Athena? Yeah. And uh, she's been coming here the last uh, four or five years with me. Um, throughout my time, um, I was born and raised in Minnesota. And uh, my mother used to be a court interpreter for Native people who didn't speak very good English. And uh, so they tell her in Ojibwe about what's going on in court. And then the judge would tell my mother, and my mother would say in Ojibwe to the native people. So she was an interpreter. And uh, my claim to fame actually is uh, <clears throat> I went through high school, wasn't normal. My whole life wasn't normal. I, uh, when I was uh, two years old, I had a total loss of my right eye. This is artificial eye. This is. Huh? I'm a bionic Indian. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, that, the first incident that happened changed my life, changed my whole life, right? I never knew what it was to uh, have two eyes. And uh, so, but I never gave it a thought. In any country, nobody really cared. Nobody said a thing. Uh, oh, how much time do I have? Hour, uh, hour and five minutes, I okay. guess, now. And uh, so I'm going to try to bring you to a closer uh, understanding of Western psychology by using Indian psychology. Um, I've been teaching for 25 collegiate years in colleges and universities. I'm a former president of the Leech Lake Travel College. I started that college and I uh, was its president for 10 years. And that's why I know this college very well. Uh, Cardi Monette, my good friend, used to be president of this college. And he was the first one that invited me over. And uh, we met at a national conference and there was only two of us presidents that spoke their language fluently. And was Dr. Lionel Bordeaux and I. And Lionel was from Cynthia Hiska University. And, uh, and then Carter introduced me and he said, this is my friend Larry Aiden from Leech Lake. He's a unique guy because he speaks a language, he's a pipe carrier, and he traversed the earth with the medicine man for 18 years. And I did. My um, knowledge, and, and that is not wisdom yet. Uh, sometimes when I get older and wiser, it'll turn to wisdom. Right now it's merely knowledge that I have. And, uh, the old man that I traveled with could doctor people for cancer, for heart disease, for uh, gallbladder. Uh, we had gallstones. He'd do a ceremony, darken the room, and then when you turn the light on, those gallstones are laying right there in a dish. Never cut you. Take them out of you. And when I met this man, he asked me, he said, do you believe that I can do this? And I said, well, yeah. He said that too quick. So one of these days I'll show you what I can do. And uh, he said, it's not me. It's just uh, medicine and the psychological understanding of the world you cannot see. He said, more things in, in our world, which is psychology, more things in our world that you cannot see has great power. And when I worked with him, uh, one of the first times I was uh, about the first three years, he said, uh, come on over tonight. He said, there's a little boy come over here. And they want me to doctor him, and I'll show you some things. So I went over, and there was a little seven-year-old boy. And his grandma brought him over to the medicine man. He said he swallowed a screw. And he said he couldn't, he couldn't uh, throw it up. He 
couldn't poop it out. He couldn't get out. It was blood. It was intestine. And then Grandma showed him an X-ray. You look at that. She said, "Hold up the light." And sure enough, there was a little screw in here. And the old man said, "Well, what do you want me to do?" He says, "Well, can you can you pray for him?" He said, "Yeah, but you want me to do more than that, don't you?" He said, "Well, can you take it out?" I don't know. He said, "We'll see." So Larry, bring him back here. He said, "Throw him in the back room." And remember, I was only three years with him, so I was. Uh, pretty amazed at what he could do. And he said, there's a little boy on a, on a bed right there, and I'll be over here on this bed. And he set up four eagle, white eagle feathers. He had a little rattle and a drum. And he asked that little boy, he said, ask that little boy if he's scared of the dark because we're turning light on. And I asked him, he said, no, if you stay right here, he said, I'll be okay. And you want me to hold your hand? He said, no, just sit by me. Okay, so I sat down, and the old man said, so put a dish by his bed. So I put a dish by his bed there. And uh, the little boy lay there and the old man turned the light off. Went totally black. And uh, I could hear the rattling, the rattling, the rattling. And he was singing in Ojibwe. And uh, then he had his little drum, he pounded his drum. He used the rattle, he pounded his drum. He used the rattle, he pounded his drum. And uh, I could hear him say to the creator, this little boy didn't mean to do this. He swallowed something by accident. And so you asked me to ask you, those invisible forces that you sent to me, Anam and Kika, those big thunderbirds, they're about seven, eight feet tall, different colors. He said, send them to me now and have them help me to do what I need to do. And so he was singing in Ojibwe and, and talking to the creator at the same time. And, uh, and he said, so come in. And he invited a big turtle. Did you ever see a big snapping turtle? He goes, <coughs> like that before it strikes. You know, I can hear it. Now I can hear <coughs> I can hear a bear in there. And pretty soon I hear <coughs> eagle feathers or this wind. And all in this room, I think, ooh, oh, he's got pretty powerful. I just sat there, listened, and, and pretty soon, you know, he asked, he said, oh, now is the time. He said, bring, bring out what you can. He said, because this little boy is pitiful. He doesn't need any harm. And hey, 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 talking to the creator. Pretty soon I heard, oh, he said, turn the light on. And right in that dish was that little screw. You know what I said? Oh, no shit. Wow, man. I looked at that and I looked at him and said, Oh, here it is. He looked at me and he said, You can't run. Every time I said, Well, give you a little bit. He said, I didn't do anything. I'm just a man. Money Duke. Big ones. The ones I saw in my vision, he said, when I was out in the woods. I painted my face black when I was eight years old. I went out in the woods fast. And these things come to me. He said, we'll be your helpers. Whenever you need us, call us. He said, they're big Thunderbirds. Seven, eight feet tall, different colors. Not the Thunderbirds you see like with a horned beak like an eagle. No, these are a straight beak. Big thunder. They're the ones that are my helpers. And they come in. And they talk to the people. They said, I just have a communication with them. I asked them to do that. You can do that. He said, a lot of times you don't even know when you pray. Um, we always pray inadvertently sometimes without saying, Oh, get your money to get your money to eat because I guess I'm not able to keep me from skulls and no yellow can not eat monitor. You can say that. Creator, hear me. I'm about to say something. I ask you for help. We you call age me to because I think I'm on chicken. Help me. Where's the tobacco? He told me to say. He told me to use tobacco. A same on. So, a same on K is putting tobacco down. He said when I do that, you'll listen to me. And so 
all his life, after that eight years he went out in the woods, he got this vision that the Thunderbirds would help him. And he said, whatever you need us, you call us. And he said, so when you have dreams, don't tell your dreams. Don't tell your dreams to anybody. He told him that. And I'll tell you that too. When you have dreams, spiritual dreams, about wind, fire, water, if you're swimming in the water, uh, if you see little animals, you see fire and lights, don't say anything. Eventually, those things will reveal themselves to you and let you know what they are. But if you tell somebody, those little spirits won't come back and give you those dreams. They're for you, no one else. You have two kinds of dreams. Daydream and night dream. Daydream is just like a night dream. You look out the window and maybe a professor over here is lecturing and you're looking out the window and you think, oh man, where it could be. <laughs> and, and it's a daydream. Pretty soon you're, you're totally gone, you're on this dream. And the professor's lecturing you way over here, and he looks at you, and if he's a uh, knowledgeable, traditional person, he won't bother you. If you're gazing out the window, you're in your own trance, your own daydream, leave it there. Because maybe you'll learn more from that little thing than you will learn from your professor. That's why I tell teachers, when I tell teachers, if somebody's daydreaming in your class, leave them alone. Maybe they're learning more daydreaming than they are listening some thought. You don't know. But in your daydreams, the things that get in the way are other people, and light, and movement, and life. At night, your spirit travels, goes everywhere. It goes on, uh, up high, in the water. You can fly. You're going to get in the car, and you go off a cliff. Ah, you know, and you're going to, and they say, if you don't wake up, you'll die. And that's not true. I hit the ground many times with my car. Many times I hit the ground and I'm still here. So don't believe what people tell you. And if you uh, ask somebody, hey, I had this dream, what do you think? They're going to tell you. Whether they know or not, they'll tell you. So don't ask anybody. Ask those sometimes that understand dreams. Give them tobacco, a gift maybe. And so I had this dream, what does it mean? Usually they'll tell you, don't say anything, go home. Wait. But if you really are insistent, you really want to know, go to somebody who can interpret dreams and they'll help you. I can do that. Over the years, I've learned to understand by our own world vision. And I'm going to put it on the board for you. Our worldview, indigenous worldview, original inhabitants of this land, our worldview, and how it came to be. In those, that worldview is your dreams. And if you know the different colors, the birds, the beings, all around, then you can interpret your dreams. And now, you know, some of you know, and some of you heard me before, when I talk to people, I ask you to understand. You came to mind now, say. Oh. You came to mind now, and if you understand, you'll say, oh. If you're a woman, you'll say, hey, yeah. Okay? Try that. Women say, hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Say, hey, yeah. Yeah? That's the way, that's the way you affirm that you heard, you understand, say. And guys, you say, oh. Guys, you say, oh. Oh, oh. So, I'll be talking today, and I'll say, "Get came to mind, huh? If you're a woman, you say, hey, yeah. If you're a guy, you say, oh. Get came to mind, huh? Oh. Yeah. All right. Always. And I've been teaching for 25 years. Non-Indian students in my class, sometimes over half, sometimes three-fourths, non-Indian. I say, "Get came to mind, huh? Oh, they'll be right now. Because I want to know that when I'm teaching them, they understand what I'm saying. Because if you don't understand what I'm saying, um, it's hard for me to explain to you what's going on. So I always have that attention. When the elders teach me, I sit on the ground in the lodge, many elders in circles, and they talk about the world. They talk about healing. They talk about life and death. They talk about real things. 
They don't talk about texting and they don't talk about the technological world we have. No, they're talking about the real world. How long we have to live? 99 years. And no one can, nobody can lengthen that 99. You get 99 years when you're born. You can live 99 years. I promise that by Creator. You can't lengthen it, but you can shorten it. And the way you live, and the way you treat other people, your choice. If you choose to treat them well and good and healthy, you will live that 99 years. But if you hate and you're angry and you're enraged and you don't understand, you shorten your own life. That's your choice. Above all the beings that get you money to do, we we cut Tonka, this, the all container, God. All of this creation <clears throat> gave everybody the same thing except us. He gave us freedom of choice. We can make choices. Sometimes we make bad choices. So then you wake up, you can make good choice. Huh? It's up to you. And you learn your choices by education, your experiences in your family and your friends. That's your education. And by those experiences, you make decisions. When you're age 11 to 16, You don't listen to anyone. You listen to only those that are 11 to 16. You don't listen to your parents. You don't listen to your professors. You don't listen to your priests, your rabbis, your ministers. You don't listen to adults because age 11 to 16, you know everything. And no one can tell you any different. But if you brought up the way I was brought up, your mother will start teaching you from birth to seven years. Only women were allowed to teach all children a long time ago. Only women. They teach you how to button the button, the comb the hair, the rest of the teeth. Take care of yourself. They teach you when you cry, you don't waste your tears. Your mother teaches you birth to seven years, everything you need to know for the rest of your life. And it's only enshrined to women, not to men. Later on, men will be teachers, but Birth to seven, everybody in the Ojibwe nation were taught by women, and only women. You kid about it? Uh -huh. yeah. So, that is the old way. And now we're fast tracking into this way. And sometimes men intrude. And we have, we males, we're wired wrong. We're wired differently than, than females. Women make better decisions than we do. And you're going to find out. Before the end of this day, women are stronger than men. They always have been and they always will be. And if you guys think that's not true, next time there's a baby in a family, you have it. <laughs> You'll be laying on that table screaming for some pain. You will see how tough you are. But they, like in the Western world, we talk about toughness, strength. They don't understand strength, toughness. Women do. Women have the child. Everybody in this room came from woman. When you die, you're going back to woman, Mother Earth. So we ought to get to know and honor the women of our world. And if you haven't said so lately to your moms, tell them, I love you and thank you for my birth. Because it was a struggle getting you on. You didn't just I'm just say, hey, here I am. <laughs> I know. Because I got married traditionally by the pipe. And there's no separation, there's no divorce, no finding a new love, never. I vowed to marry my wife forever until she dies or until I die. That's Indian way. And so in my training to get married, the first thing they said to me is you need to deliver your own children from your wife's body with your own hands. And if you do, you will never hit her or your children. Because you know how much love, pain, agony she put into this relationship. How much did you put in? Not that much. And so 
I think if most men had to deliver babies from their wife's body, they'd have less spouse abuse, less child abuse. But usually a man's out doing something else and a woman's left there to do this by herself or with other women. So you have to do that. If you can't deliver your children, you ought to be there at birth and hold their hands and help them. And you'll love that wife for the moment for the rest of your life. I know that. These are part of the training that I had to get married. I had three years of spiritual training before I could get married. And at the end of three years, the old man said, I'll give you 12 people to see, Larry, and 12 people for Polly to see. In a whole year, you'll go out and you'll, you'll gain education. You'll learn all you can about women and their strength and their beauty. And you, Polly, you'll learn to take care of men. And their biggest problem is their own ego. You'll have to learn how to take care of that ego. And, but we'll send you to 12 women and they'll teach you about this. When I first got married, my wife was way younger than I and she said, you mean I'm going to boss him around? The old man said, yeah. She said, no, he's older, wiser, smart. He, now I marry him, I'm, no, I want to marry him because he's older and wiser and experienced. He's got two cars, he's got a home in Duluth and one in Bemidji, and he's got money in the bank. <laughs> and I want to marry him because he's a good provider. And she said, no, you'll be in charge of him. You'll boss him around. You'll tell him to be a good father. You'll tell him to be a good provider. You'll do this. You'll train him for the rest of his life. His mother trained him up until now. Now it's up to you. And that's true. I got married 25 years ago. And if you saw us in our home, you'd never think that she wouldn't boss me around way back a long time ago. Now she's in total charge. And if she's not happy, nobody's happy. And so she says, you do this, you do that. All right, all right, you know. And every day I teach. And I come home and I'll say something and she says, whoop, what did you say? You're not talking to your students. You're home. You're my husband. Behave. Yes, dear. This big, strong stuff, man. Yes, dear. Okay. She's in charge. And she makes better decisions than I do. A long time ago, I did an experiment on who makes better decisions. I asked the women in the group, if you could do anything you wanted to do, what would you do? Don't tell me. Write it on a piece of paper. Write three things you'd do this weekend. Then I went to an all-male conference and I asked all the men, if you could do anything you want this weekend, don't tell me, write it down, three things, what would you do? Then I compared it. Men said, I'd go hunting, I'd go fishing, I'd go golfing, I'd go muddy. That's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you buy a brand new truck, and you take it out of the mud and you get it just as filthy and dirty as you can going through the mud. Women just go scratch their heads and say, you guys are wired really wrong. Why you buy a new truck and then you go get it dirty? The old man told me, because you like playing the sandbox game. The only difference between men and boys are the other and the toys. See, you play in a sandbox, get all dirty and muddy. You don't see too many girls doing that. The guys like to get really dirty. And you carry that all the way to your adulthood. I still want to do that. The girls are painting the nails. Punching your head. You don't see them getting all filthy dirty. Some of them do. That. Not all of them, but some like to do that. And but we men were wired differently, and so you have to know that. That's part of the training when you're getting get married. I have to know the difference between genders and what we do as boys and what girls need. And I pray to God, believe this. But I have all girls. I don't want any dumb boys. <laughs> Excuse me, guys, but I grew up with five brothers. I wouldn't wish a boy on anybody. Because we were hell on wheels. 
and I couldn't take me anywhere. When I was three years, two or three years old, I'd go to somebody's house and I'd pull the curtain down, trying to climb up the curtain. So I tipped the water over, I still was going to boil water. Boy, I was always getting into trouble. I mean, it's no wonder I lost my eye when I was two years old, because all these older kids were breaking bottles, throwing rocks at, at glass. I walked in the middle like that, looking around, and piece of glass hit me right here. And I wouldn't be able to see if I would have just left it, and the doctor would have pulled it off. But I didn't know any better. I was two years old. I wrote, ah! And I cut my eyeball out and hung my cheek. And I went running to the house, mom! My eyeball hanging right here. And like traditional Indian mothers, she looked at me and said, oh my goodness. She grabbed a dish towel. She put my eye back in a socket. She held a dish towel until we got to the hospital, 78 miles away. And because it took too long to get there, the doctor said, if you hadn't rubbed it, you'd be all right, but you cut all the nerves, you'll never see again out of that eye. And so my mother had the old dish towel, and she held it like that over my eye. I don't know what a man would do. But I know what a woman did. She tried to comfort me, tried to put my eye back and hold it there until help came. <clears throat> That's the, again decisions that mothers make every day. Mothers are wired pretty cool. They know what to do. So when I compared notes, man said, I want to go golfing, I want to go fishing, I want to do this. I asked and I looked at the women and said, we should go camping, we should go on a picnic, we should visit relatives. We, we, family, men, I, me, my. See the difference? Again, women are already starting to think about family. What should we do together? Not what can I do, go golfing, go fishing, go hunting, or go money. She said, we, we, family, we ought to go on a picnic. We ought to visit relatives. We ought to go to power. She's including everybody in the family. And guys think about themselves. And so from that, I understood how we were, we're, we're really wired differently. And you have to learn that, that through marriage, your, your wife helps you understand that. You're not alone. You're a provider. You're a protector. And the first order of a protector is to learn how to pray. And pray every day for the protection and the strength of your family. Every day. Without fail. That's your number one job as a man. Protector. And a provider, that means... If you don't have food in your house, you don't send your girlfriend or your wife for commodities and food stamps, you go. You're the provider. That's the difference. You came on. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. And now I want to give you some things. A long time ago, there was nothing. Only this. The creator. And in this world dwell the Creator. The Creator had an immense dream. That's why dreams are important to us. Total blackness. And in that total blackness was God. Get your money to do it. We can We all contain God had these dreams. And he saw things. And he saw these things here. <coughs> And he saw these things all around. And there were little lights. And in this dream, he said, what are those lights? I must find out. So he went to the light and examined the light and found out it, it's a being. It's a soul. It's alive. And then the dream went on and he saw things. He saw things here. He put a face on it. And this one. And he saw this. And he looked at this dream. And he examined the dream and analyzed the dream and realized that all these 
light we call a nung. You look up in the nighttime sky and you see billions of stars. They're not stars. They're souls. Born and unborn. You all came from the spirit world. You're once nothing but a spirit, a soul. And when the vortex opens here, you decided you're going to come down. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You write your own life script as you experience life. You don't know that. But you choose your parents. You choose to be born. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know. You only know that you have to life, safety, protection, love, warmth. It's the only thing you feel when you come down. You think I'll take a chance this time. And you do. And that's how you're born. You're born by choice to be alive and to be secure and be happy. And from here, you come down to here. This is our key. Or Earth. And this is the moon. And this is the sun. And this is stars, but also the spirit world. This is the first upper world. Only known as creator world. Nobody dwells there but the creator. And below the creator's world is the second upper world. Second upper world, it's the spirit world. That's where you came from and that's where you're going back to. If you know your language and you study your culture, you'll know where you came from. You'll know where you are, and you know where it's possible to go. Just by understanding your culture and your language. You can't do it. That's why people say, learn your language, use your tobacco, get your Indian name. Three things you have to do as a native. Only three things. Get a spirit name, use your tobacco, and use your language. Three things. They didn't say be fluent. They said use your language. The reason you're not fluent, not your fault. I should not be here into, going into the 21st century talking to you and using my native language. And espousing to be a native man. I should be dead or assimilated, totally, using my own English. That's what this federal government intended for us to be by the time the 20th century came. Only our past and our ancestors would read about them. How did that happen that we survived? Especially in Turtle Mountain. You came to our survival. We left you a long time ago. You came out here. We were supposed to come with you. But we stayed in Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin. I'm a pillager Indian, and I'd rather fight than leave. They tell you good things will happen you come out here. So they send all the Turtle Mountain people out here. You weren't Turtle Mountain people, you came from Turtle Mountain. You dwelled here. You have survival language. The language you use, the culture you have, is your survival culture, your survival language. Use it. If it's Bishop, use it. If it's Ojibwe, use it. Your original language, though, was Ojibwe. And you changed to Mitchell because that's a survival language. That's what you needed to survive as a native community. So you used the best thing you had. The only thing you had. You invented things. When you talk Mitchell's language, I can understand most of it. Because there's a little bit of Cree, a little bit of Ojibwe, a little bit of French. And I understand that. So, People in Turtle Mountain, you're survivors. People in Minnesota were survivors too. When we held intact the Ojibwe, the traditional Ojibwe Indian, we are the elder brother of the three fires. The three fires are the Ojibwe, the elder brother, and Ottawa, or Dawa, or Dawe, their second elder brother, and then we have Pawani, they're the fire keepers keepers of sacred tobacco. The three fires, those are our ancestors. And then other tribes too, second part. They're part of us too, Algonquian people. But the three fires, that's us. 
I have a beaded necklace with three mega shells. Megas is a sacred symbol in the lodge. I have three of them to represent the Ojibwe, Ottawa, Ottawa, three fire confederacy. And a lot of people look at this and say, oh, that's really nice necklace. That's really cool. Oh, look at those shells. That's nice. They have no understanding. And I don't have the time nor the inclination to sit them down and school them. But they say, well, thank you. And go on. But to me, it is my lifeblood. To me, I understand this thing in totality. And the worldview, this is the Ojibwe worldview we've come from. And so the first of the world created world, only the creator dwells there. Then the created all these things didn't understand what they were, realized that they're souls. And so right below the creative world is the spirit world. And that's where you came from. When you die, that's where you go back to. You already learned something today. You came from here, you're going back to here. We call it spirit world. Non-Indians call it the great beyond, heaven, up there. When I ask non-Indian people about where is the great beyond, they can't tell me. It's, it's, it's up there, it's by the Creator, maybe near the Creator. Or is it in the Creator's world? Well, we don't know that, but it's, I said, where's heaven? It's up there. Well, where, specifically? We don't know. It's, 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 well, maybe in our Bible it says we're in the house of the Lord. Maybe the Lord, oh, no, you got another name for God. Lord, that's nice. But where's the Lord then? And they said, where are you going? He said, well, I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know this? Well, why are you asking around? Because you're telling me to be this, and you don't even understand it yourself. <coughs> they try to make me Catholic once. I resisted. And they could not make me Catholic. What? Because I asked questions. Too many questions. I was a nosy little guy. I wanted to know everything. If it's so cool and so great, then how come you don't know this thing? And I asked the people in catechism, they say, Jesus was God's son, came here, taught us, and at age 12, he left the temple and, yes? Where did he go after he left the temple? What? Said, Where did he go? I said, you teach about Jesus all the way until he's 12 years old, teaching all these elders and all the great people in the world about religion, about his father, his father God, and then Jesus leaves. Where does he go? And how come you never read about Jesus as a teenager? Did he get pimples? Did his voice change? Go through puberty? What? <laughs> what are you? Well, I said you tell him in the mirror. Well, where was he? Fifty our father and fifty Hail Marys and go and kneel in the corner. I don't know how that helped me. I was praying over there and you God help me figure out where Jesus went because they go over here and do something. I don't know how. I don't know what I did. And I was always asking questions. I can't blindly believe something that I can't see. I want to know. If I don't know it, there must be an invisible force that moves it, has energy, and can show me. And that's exactly what God is. Through my teaching, my understanding, it's an invisible force that has energy and can move things. It's psychological as well as spiritual. So our culture, psychological and spiritual, that's why it's incumbent upon you to know your own psychology. This is your own psychology. And if you know this, then you can question, wow, at least I know where I am, I know where I came from, I know where I'm going. There is no mystery. And by the time I was 35 years old, I finally asked the Methodist administrator, I said, can you tell me something? He invited me over for supper, and I went over. He said, I said, can you tell me something? He said, sure. Why? Where did Jesus go after he left the temple? What? I said, I read the Bible. The most talked about person in the whole Bible is Jesus. Fact. There's an 18-year gap. He left the temple 
And then he's probably never read about him again until they're ready to nail him up on a car. Then it's like there's a whole gap missing. Where was he? And he said to me, we don't know, it's a mystery. We're just told to believe. Believe something you don't know about anything about. He said, yeah. He said, maybe your people know. My people? I said, Jesus didn't come for me. As I know it, in our Birchbark Scroll teachings, the Law's teachings, there are deities. But we don't have a person. In. So I went and asked the elders. Up did you go, Peter? We should know all Jesus. Up did you go to which one? Who's this man? Get your money, get your money, or can't talk. How many of you came that same? I don't understand. Madeline, sit down. A long time ago, they said there was a man that might have been Jesus. We don't know. But in our scrolls, it says the man came to us, light skinned, had a glow. We knew he must be a spiritual man. He looked at us and our people and he said, your people have a good way to understand my father. Keep your way, keep your language, don't ever lose it. It's a good way. I need to go where I'm needed, where people don't know about my father. I said that in our birch bark scrolls. And all the people that talk about Jesus never knew where he went, but in the scrolls it said this man came here. He said, I must be about the work of my father. So when he left at temple at age 12, he was seeking out the people of, on earth who didn't have religion, who didn't have spirituality. Being about the work of my father. He didn't mean Joseph the father, his surrogate father, the carpenter. He wasn't born of Joseph. That was not his father. That was surrogate father. He was a spiritual being, Jesus. I know this. I studied and read the Bible twice. First because the hack this made me do it. I didn't understand it, then I resisted. But then later when I got to college, I unraveled it. There's some beautiful passages in the Bible. Only they're ideal. It says we ought to treat man as we treat each other. No one is greater than anyone else. Hmm. We're a Christian nation. Hmm. Yet we discriminate against blacks, against Indians, against Hispanics, against women, against gays. How can we all be equal when there's discrimination, hatred, and bigotry going on? And if you're made in God's image, would God do that? Not people that are talking for God. God didn't want. Man to lay with man. So homosexuality is wrong. Oh, who told you that? I mean, you didn't know where, where Jesus went from age 12 to 28. And now you're telling me to just blindly believe you got a message from God that said homosexuality is bad and not good? And I'm going to believe that? I didn't believe it the first time. So now you're telling me again look at what the Bible says. Who does that? We do. We interpret the Bible. How many times have you natives been misinterpreted, misunderstood. How many times? They write about you in history. They talk about you. And there's all these stereotypical notions about how you are and what you are. And they got it wrong. 90% of the history they write about us is wrong, totally wrong. It's made up figment of their imagination and somebody guessed this is what we would have done for actors. Because you go back in history, who wrote the Bible? Male monks in the Dark Ages. Male monks in the Dark Ages. They never intended women to be smart enough, experienced enough, or educated enough to learn this stuff. <coughs> Back then, they said women are to cook for men, have babies, and clean the house, and nothing else. Do we still believe that? We must, because we have to pass laws in the United States to give equal rights to women. I mean, we are sure we'll do. The Bible says treat, not only treat your fellow man, but your partner, like Adam and Eve. 
Are they equal? Hmm. <coughs> How far back do you go with this? That's why I get a big kick out of today's world. They all say, boy, we ought to kick those illegal immigrants out of our country. This is our country, USA. And I always say, kick what immigrants out? How far back do you want to go with this? Maybe we ought to go to 1492 and give you a 30-day pass. <laughs> and if you're an act right live right, we'll send you back to here. Because you're the first immigrants. They say, who is this guy? Oh, I said I learned your Bible. I learned your history. I learned more stuff about you than you know about you. And I know more about you than you know about me because you never asked me how I am. And when you came here, we knew God as native people to greater dimensions than we ever know God today. And you gave us all your Christianity and Bibles and sacred teachings. But you didn't intend us to know God better. You intended us to change, to be like you, so you could accept us better. And you know what? That's not true either. No matter how short you cut your hair, no matter how you dress, no matter how you speak, you're going to walk in a store someday and say, look at those Indians, you better watch them, they're going to steal something. See? They've been talking about you. They get it right. And they follow you around. When my daughter Athena was a little girl, we were in Target, religion. And I was president of the college. And they followed me around. Follow that Indian family around, you never know, they'll steal, they'll take something. The guy that's following me around, I probably had more money in my pocket than he had. Why would I steal? So I asked him, I said, uh, can I help you? And he said, what do you mean? I said, why are you been following me? He said, what do you want? Oh, no, I'm not following you. I'm just shopping like anyone else. He said, he picked up something, put it back, you know. <laughs> so I turned the table on him and started following him. And he looked at me and he looked at me and I followed him around. <laughs> he didn't buy anything either. He was looking at everything, putting things back, following him around. Finally, he looked down, he thought he lost you. He looked down at me, he looked down at me. He quickly he ran in the, in the door. It's the employees only. He went in there. You know, if I was a younger man, I would have drug him out and slapped him up. <laughs> I'm older and wiser now. I just opened the door and I looked and I said, are you still shopping in here too? And then I told him. I just want to let him know, you followed me around because I'm brown. You followed me around stereotypified me and thought I was going to steal it from your store. You're wrong. The biggest perpetrators in the United States of America are 11 to 13 year old white females. They're the biggest petty thefts of all time. Did you know that? Now you know it. See, two things you learned today. It's not Indians. It's 11 to 13 year old white female girls. Petty theft. You know why they see it? Because they need it? See, they never ever protest against their parents. Look at me. Look at how much jewelry I got. Look at these earrings I got. They didn't even, they were so damn dumb. They didn't even know I got it. Look at this. Oh, look at this thing I got here. I love my finger on that how much I got. Age 11 to 13 year old white girls in America steal more than anyone else. Petty fact. That's statistics. And yet they follow you around. You have to tell, hey, I'm not white female, I'm 11 to 13, I'm not going to steal, so don't follow me around. It's okay. Maybe you got to give them a, a little card and walk into Target and say, here you go, here's my card. I uh, don't steal because I'm Indian, I don't do this because I'm Indian. <laughs> I mean, it's not like fried bread, but that's because I have some scoring. Give them a little card when you walk in. So they know who you are. All of our lives we've been wrongly accused of things. All of our lives we've been wrongly accused of things. Believe me. We're still here. And now they're trying to find out why. You were supposed to be dead or assimilated. We had wars. We tried to kill you off. We spread you. Diseases among your people to kill you out, smallpox, diphtheria, whooping cough. We give you these things to kill you out. Because a long time ago, the only good Indians are dead. 
You're not supposed to be here, yet you survived. Why are you here? You know why? They could never take this away from us. They looked at us and our people and why we're still here. We Jury McLuck and Why are you still here survivors? We know I got I got to make out of one these one here. People at least think we're still here. Still speak our language. And they said, well, what keeps the keep the people going? Why are they still here? We tried to convert them to Catholicism. It didn't, didn't work. We tried to put our school systems in. They only speak English. And don't speak anything else but English. Be American. Don't be anything. Don't be native. And yet they're still here. What is wrong? And they keep praying. And they keep praying. Uh, when they first got here from Europe, they said, you're pagans. You're savages. You don't understand God as we understand God. You have to pray to God this way. God intends us to open the black book, the Bible, and use rosaries and listen to priests and rabbis, ministers, and Jewish people to tell us about God. And if you don't do that, you're really not Christian. You're really not civilized. And yet we survived. And people are now questioning, what is wrong with these Indians? They're still here. They're not even Indians. Somebody that landed here was a lost, Christopher Columbus, was a lost Italian, discovered himself in America, looked at all of us and said, ah, I was looking for India. So these must be Indians. I'm glad he wasn't looking for turkey. Because <laughs> you'd all be turkeys. Beer of Turkey Affairs, American Indian Turkey Movement. <laughs> yeah. But this lost Italian, discovered in South America and thought we were an Indian, so they call us Indian. And from that day, we call ourselves <coughs> Indian. Is that right? It's a nickname. Our true name is Oji. Our true name is Anishinaabe. Anishinaabe means the people, all two legged. All the two legged that came from here. Right here. And so when I tell my name, here's your heaven, here's your great beyond. That's where he's very came from. That's where everybody comes from. If you believe in God and have a soul and a spirit, I just interpreted it for you. That's where you came from. That's where you're going back. That's, that's the key. Those Indians. It's their God. That's what's keeping them going. You're right. Because our God is God. And no matter how you cut it, no matter how you put the cipher or interpret it, <coughs> this is our creator. It's your money too. We call Tom, God. We all contain the Lord. Our we call God. He can never take that from anyone. Back here, this is the third upper world. The sun and the earth unite. This is Grandmother Moon. Who's in charge of cycles and seasons. And the closer the moon gets to the earth, then you have seasons and cycles and high tides and low tides. So Grandmother Moon is in charge of that. Father, Son, and Mother Earth unite. And they have four children. They're called the four orders of the earth. And the first order is the soil and, and the mountains. That's what the term And the second order are the green things, um, like the flowers, the trees, the leaf. And the third order is animals, fish, insects. And the fourth order. Are here. Yeah. These are all 
beans. Soil beans, mountain beans, green grass, green flowers, trees. These are beans. We call it Gitigana, Gitigana. It's like creator's garden right here. The trees, the flowers, the grasses, they're all beans too. And tree will help you. These are the four orders. These are children of Mother Earth. So we're related. We're related to the tree, we're related to the grass, we're related to all the things, related to the mountains. We have the same thing. All these things have things in common. You have the same gift of life. songs or prayers and we enjoy all these. And any of these things, they all know if we have need, they'll die for us. So around your table when you say, thank you God for my daily bread, actually what you're saying is thank you for dying that I live. Psychologically, that's what you're saying. This is our, our world view. Creator created all of this. And the spirit of the sun, the spirit of the moon, the spirit of the four orders of the earth. And all these are spirits that are born and unborn. When you seek to be born, you come back, you come to earth and you're born. When you die, you go back to the spirit world. And there are like four days that we have to light a fire and say, this is your journey. Go back to where you came from, the spirit world. You can come back again, because we believe in life after death. <coughs> And those that have died all live back here in the spirit world. Your grandpas, your aunties, your brothers, sisters, the ones that died are still here. They're waiting for you. And they'll wait for you. And sometimes they come back before you can get up there. They'll come back as something else. You can't come back as you are, but you come back as one of these four orders. Maybe you come back as a flower, a tree, a deer, or you come back as another person. But you cannot come back as you are. You came on. Uh -huh. yeah. You can't come back as you are. But you can come back. So when we send somebody here back to the spirit world, we say in our traditional way, four days it takes you journey. And you go so far you come back. Go so far you come back. Go so far you come back. Why do we say go and don't look back? Go and be there for a year. Do what you need to do for a year, and we'll remember you a year from now. We call it a ghost feast or memorial feast. We we'll call you back and say, we know you've been dead now for a year, but now having this big feast, remembering you. And we miss you, we love you. And we'll see you again soon. That's why there's no word for goodbye, no joke. We say, I know all good, we know. We'll see you again someday, or we'll see you later. There's no goodbye. Goodbye is forever. We say, I know all good, we know. We'll see you later. So when you die, you say, I'll oh, see you later. And you will all go to the spirit world because that's where you started from. Our world is perpetrated on not seeing things. This Sunday, there's going to be something hopping out in the woods. You carry a basket. If you have eggs in it, you be hopping. Here come Peter Hopping down the bunny, hippity hoppy, happy. Do you believe in Easter Bunny? I do. 
Do you believe in Santa Claus? I do. Do you believe in all the magic things that happen? The greatest book ever written in a long, long time is Harry Potter. Because Harry Potter knew and understood things that we need to do. You people are the magic folk. We had magic. I am a wizard. My wand is my pipe. And I can tell them things like that. And I can talk and understand the four orders of the earth, four upper worlds, or the creator. Harry Potter thought to be imaginary magic, no. When you're a child, magic was so important. Don't let that magic die as an adult. You're still magic. My daughter asked me when she read Harry Potter, she was the one that introduced us to Harry Potter when she was in, I don't know, what grade were you in, honey? Like third, I think. Third grade. She brought this book home and she said, this is really cool. And this Harry Potter guy is a cool guy. And so we started reading it together as a family. And I came out here when I think I was 12, and my other daughter, Anne, was eight. I have another daughter at home now, and she's eight years old. So I think was 24, Anne's 21, and Josie's eight. <laughs> that was a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we got it all done. We are all done having kids, and then all of a sudden, oh, another one coming. And it's Josie. And we take what we can get. We're natives. And I got three girls. Josephine, eight years old. Ho Mapi Karlinga. I mean, good nest builder, Ho Chunk. The Jacobin is a quick, spotted eagle woman, Nina. The new quick, golden eagle woman, and All girls. And I pray for girls. Because they're clean. <laughs> I never try to get my truck all dirty running through the mud. <laughs> but I really wanted girls because I knew the corner of our society, of our world, is women. <coughs> we must seek to honor and love women and cherish them all around us, respect them. And if you guys want to get girls, I can teach you how to get girls. <laughs> 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 you know how to get girls? Respect them. Don't ever talk about them. Don't ever say something negative about girls. Don't ever say you did something when you didn't. Girls don't brag like that. We guys do. Going to the bathroom. Well, I was over on Makeup Hill this weekend. Getting my girl. Yeah, we were up there, and you know, uh, we did, uh, we know what we kind of did. We kind of did the, the thing, you know. You got barely got a kiss, and you're lying about it. <laughs> I mean, you're thinking about it. You guys ever think about girls going to the bathroom? Hi. Oh, boy, it was a good weekend. Take the score on me. <laughs> <laughs> the girls do that? No, they don't do that. Because they're wired differently. Respect and honor girls. They always want to be around you. Don't talk about them. Don't gossip about them. They'll want to be with you. That's the way you attract girls. You came to mind. Oh. Oh, yeah, I taught you a quick lesson here. How to get girls pretty soon. You start respecting girls. All oh, girls want to be around you too because you guys are cool. Respect girls. You don't talk about them. Be good to them. And love your mothers. This is our worldview. This is the psychology of us, we Indians. We won't go away. We won't change. We continue to use what we have. You have survival language, survival culture, survival people here in Turtle Mountain. Keep it all intact. Love each other, respect each other. Be glad when somebody succeeds. Be glad when somebody wins in wrestling or wins in basketball. Be happy for them. Don't be envious. Don't be angry toward each other. This is all you have. You came to Mount Up. And this is your worldview. And if you use this to decipher, you'll know. If I had more time, I could tell you about this, 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 and this. But I'll cut short on time. Now, this is the East. 
Wabanum, the color is yellow. Sal Chalanum, the color is white. Ningabianum, west, the color is red. Kiradanum, north, the color is black. And they all have animals, sacred animals. And when you see those animals in your dream, you know what's happening. From the east, you have little bitty animals like a squirrel, a chipmunk, even a mouse. Mouse, wa wa ba ji That's why you say mouse. See a mouse in your dream, something brand new is coming to you tomorrow. New knowledge, new life, new boyfriend. <laughs> new something, something new is coming to you. You don't know what it's going to be. From the south, healing and warmth coming. To the west, I'm going to keep uh, Thunderbird there, the big one. A little bit of creative power in the west. From the north, cleansing and purification. So all these colors have meaning. And if you dream in color, you can decide for your own dream by your own psychology. I hope to be back again to speak to you. Now we have other work to do. Thank you very much for listening. Be good.